Our scripture reading for this morning is Psalm 48. Psalm 48, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there. Anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ship's Of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. I need to begin by saying a word about the structure of this psalm. Uh, Gerald Wilson, the late uh, professor of Old Testament and biblical Hebrew at Azusa Pacific University, concludes that this psalm is divided into four stanzas, two on each side of a central verse that emphasizes the main theme of the whole psalm. This central theme verse is verse 8. We could think of it like the hymns that we sing today. Verse 8 would be like the chorus or the refrain that you would sing after each verse for emphasis. And the four verses of the hymn psalm would be the two stanzas before and the two stanzas after verse 8. And so we begin by jumping right into the text. Look with me at verse 8, this theme verse for the whole psalm. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. So what is the key theme of this verse that then becomes the key theme of the whole psalm? Well, one of the ways that you would answer that question would be to look for repetition, which may indicate the emphasis of the author, and meaning is always determined by the intention of the author. And when you observe verse 8, you'll notice two words that are repeated, city is mentioned twice, God is mentioned twice, and God is referred to a third time in this verse by his personal name, Yahweh. That's Lord in all caps. This is a psalm about the one true living God, Yahweh, and his relationship to a city, his city, the city of our God, the city of the Lord of hosts. And as the last line of this central theme verse makes clear, God is committed to establishing this city forever. This means, as other translations indicate, he will make it safe forever. He will make it secure forever. But there's more in this central verse, as you can see. It begins by saying, as we have heard, so have we seen. And this is where it starts to get personal. 
God is in this city. I think it's implied here in verse 8. It's made even more explicit in verse 3. God is in the city. That's why it's called the city of our God. But they haven't just heard all the things that God has done in this city. They have personally experienced them for themselves. So let me summarize the theme of this psalm extracted from this verse in this way. God's enduring presence keeps his people secure. And this was not just an objective truth for these people. It was something that they came to know for themselves in a personal, subjective way. They didn't just hear and come to learn about God. They came to know God as their God. Two weeks ago, my favorite English-born Canadian evangelical theologian died, five days short of his 94th birthday, J.I. Packer. There he is. He uh, came here to Orlando to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award where I got to meet him, and then his plane was delayed four hours, and I got to spend those four hours with him. It was an amazing gift to me. Actually, he's not just my favorite English-born Canadian evangelical theologian, he's my favorite author of all to read. And his work of greatest impact around the world is his book, Knowing God. And in it, he drives home the goal of learning anything about God. So these people hadn't just heard, they sought for themselves. Now consider the words of Packer. Our aim in studying the Godhead must be to know God himself better. Our concern must be to enlarge our acquaintance, not simply with the doctrine of God's attributes, but with the living God whose attributes they are. As he is the subject of our study and our helper in it, so he must himself be the end of it. We must seek in studying God to be led to God. It was for this purpose that revelation was given, and it is to this use that we must put it. And how are we to do this? How can we turn our knowledge about God into knowledge of God? The rule for doing this is simple but demanding. It is that we turn each truth that we learn about God into matter for meditation before God, leading to prayer and praise to God. We have some idea, perhaps, what prayer is, but what is meditation? Well, may we ask, he said, for meditation is a lost art today, and Christian people suffer grievously from their ignorance of this practice. Meditation, he said, is the activity of calling to mind, thinking over, dwelling upon, and applying to oneself the various things that one knows about the works and the ways and the purposes and the promises of God. It is an activity of holy thought, consciously performed in the presence of God, under the eye of God, by the help of God, and then this is key, as a means to communion with God. We don't want to just hear about God. We don't want to just accumulate facts about the divine spirit. We want to experience him. We want to know him in a deeply personal way for ourselves. It is his presence that makes the city secure, and it is his presence that makes our lives secure. I mean, what do you pray for a family like the Cunninghams when we heard 
As I heard on Friday about how close Julia was to passing into the presence of the Lord, what do you pray for them at a time like that? I just felt so prompted to pray that they would know the reality of God's presence at this time with them now, the reality of his presence. What city are we talking about here? Well, it's referred to in the psalm as Mount Zion, and later on, verse 12, just Zion. Uh, What do we know about the city, Zion? Michael Hoodman summarizes it well for us. He says, Zion is synonymous with the city of God, and it is a place that God loves. Zion is Jerusalem. Mount Zion is the high hill on which David built a citadel. The word Zion appears over 150 times in the Bible. It essentially means fortification. Zion is described as both the city of David and the city of God. And as the Bible progresses, the word Zion expands its scope and takes on additional spiritual meaning. In the Old Testament, Zion refers figuratively to Israel as the people of God. Isaiah 60, 14. In the New Testament, Zion refers to God's spiritual kingdom. For example, we are not, we have not come to Mount Sinai, says the author of Hebrews, but, quote, to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, 22. Peter, quoting Isaiah 28, 16, refers to Christ as the cornerstone of Zion. 1 Peter 2, 6. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Zion, the spiritual heavenly Jerusalem we enter through faith in Jesus Christ. Tom Hale also points out the psalmist didn't know it, but soon those great fortifications would be cast down and Jerusalem would fall. But God had promised us a new Jerusalem that will never fall and where God will reign forever. One more on this subject, Tim Keller. When this psalm was written, the city of God was Jerusalem, containing the hill of Zion with the temple, the place for the atonement of sin. But after Jesus, who was the final temple and sacrifice for sin, the city of God now becomes a community of faithful both in heaven and on earth. The earthly Jerusalem never did draw in the nations, but the transformed community of believers in Christ did. Jerusalem has been destroyed many times since Psalm 48 was written. And so it's either, when it says that his presence then makes it secure, it's either wishful, false thinking, it's fake scripture, or... It's ultimately pointing us to something greater, a new Jerusalem where God's people will experience his presence forever, the heavenly Jerusalem of Hebrews 12. And so Psalm 48 is both testifying to God's presence in a physical city within history, Jerusalem, and pointing us to the ultimate fulfillment in the future of a new Jerusalem known for God's presence and the security that it brings. Theme verse 8 then is this. God's enduring presence keeps his people secure. That's the refrain. But let's look at the stanzas of the song now. Stanza number 1, verses 1 through 3. God's presence elicits joyous praise from his people. Verse 1, great 
is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. We used to sing these verses as a song. Uh, camp song back in my Bible camp days. Some of you made me know that song. I liked the song a lot. I still remember it. I still sing it sometimes when I'm alone. But I didn't really grasp the richness of its meaning. The key is God's presence. God's presence makes the mountain holy. God's presence makes this a place of beauty. God's presence makes it a place of contagious joy that overflows and spreads to the very ends of the earth. God has made himself known here on this mountain. That's what makes it special. God has made himself known in this city. And what did he reveal about himself through his presence on this Mount Zion? That he himself is a fortress. You may remember that this is just what was taught back in Psalm 46. In fact, the last verse of Psalm 46 says, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. A fortress is a place of extraordinary security. A fortress is a safe place to be. And what we discover in Psalm 46 and now in Psalm 48 is that the safest place of all to be is in God's presence. Not just hearing about God's presence, and not just uh, hearing other people talk about God's presence, but experiencing that presence for ourselves, knowing Him, communing with him, finding our identity, our refuge, our safety in him. Back in Psalm 46, even though the mountains were falling into the sea, even though the nations are raging, why was the city not moved at all? Because verse 5 in that psalm says, because God is in the midst of her. And so here in Psalm 48, God reveals himself as a fortress for his people, which then triggers expressions of praise. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Stanza number two, verses four to seven. God's presence strikes fear and panic in his enemies. Verses 4 to 7. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together, and as soon as they saw it, they were astounded, they were in panic, they took to flight, trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. Such vivid descriptions here of what happens when God's enemies are exposed to the place of his presence. So just kind of review these vivid descriptions. Here are are all the royal elite, all the kings and their heavily armed and expertly trained armies teamed up together to attack God's people. But as soon as they saw the place of God's presence, the city where he resides, they were astounded. They went into complete panic mode. They turned around and ran away. They took to flight. Which reminds me exactly of what happens when the demonic enemies encounter Jesus Christ. Right? Whoa! 
Who are you? What did you come here for to do? What are you going to do with us? Remember, all the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ. When the demonic enemies encounter him, they go into this kind of mode described here. Jesus has all authority over evil. And that authority has been delegated to his people. Richard Lovelace in his book, Dynamics of Spiritual Life, says part of teaching the whole gospel to Christ followers is teaching them the authority that they have over demonic enemies. He says Christians should, a Christian should lay hold by faith of every dimension of strength with which his union with Christ induce him. So that we should say, I am accepted by God as righteous. I am delivered from the power of sin. I am not alone because I have the Holy Spirit as my counselor and I have authority against fallen spirits who tremble in the presence of Jesus. And that's what happens here. The enemies see the place where God resides and they begin trembling. They begin experiencing the anguish of a woman in labor. Have you ever been with a woman in labor? I was three times. And um, I just remember hearing uh, words screamed that I'd never heard before. And I remember that I wish I would have taken my wedding ring off because there was a superhuman strength that crushed my fingers. And I was told in no uncertain terms to not lecture her about her Christianity right now. And it was a terrifying experience. And I was not even the one experiencing the labor. I was just there as a support. Amazing what women go through to give birth. But the pain that seizes a woman at a time like that is exactly what happens to the enemies of God when they encounter him. One more metaphor in these verses. These armies of the enemy kings were like one of those grand ships from Tarshish that just get pulverized by God's east wind. Magnificent structures built by humans and just a little poof of God splatter, just destroys them. Hurricanes should always remind us that our God reigns and his enemies do not. Stanza number three, verses nine to 11. God's presence lets us celebrate his perfections. Verse nine, we have thought on your steadfast love, O oh God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O oh God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth, because your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Once you become personally acquainted with the true God, it produces gladness and rejoicing in your life. This is really true. That one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is joy expressed. Specifically here, the psalmist lists three of God's greatest attributes, three of God's perfections that then prompt spontaneous celebration. And the first one is mentioned in verse nine. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. This is God's special, enduring, rock-solid love, his steadfast hesed, that's the word. And we now know that love most clearly and permanently in Christ, most explicitly expressed in Romans 8. Not death itself, nor anything that we might experience in life, nor angelic or demonic power, nothing in our lives now or in the future, no distance of height or plummets of depth, nor anything else that has ever been created will ever be able to separate our lives from the love of God given to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And it's as if the psalmist says, we've done just what J.I. Packer instructed. We called to mind and we have thought over and dwelt upon and applied to ourselves what we have come to know about the love of God in Christ Jesus. Or as verse 9 actually puts it, we have thought about your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. My longing for you is that through the teaching ministry of God's word here, my longing is that you would, your experience here would have that effect on your life. That this would be a place that you, you don't just attend a service, uh, you don't just listen to what hopefully are interesting sermons, you don't just sing songs here, you don't just listen to somebody else pray, but that, that as you hear uh, about the manifold perfections of God being sung or prayed or, or declared from this teaching stand, that you would think about them, that you would reflect upon them, that you would savor them, until you discover welling up within you gladness. Until you'd be prompted to rejoice right out loud at the greatness of our God. Maybe what you could do, it seems like here, for example, they just took the steadfast love of God, for example, and they say, we thought about that. We took time in the temple to reflect upon the greatness of your steadfast love, oh God, you're amazing. So that's a good pattern for us, perhaps, when you read the scriptures, to just find something that it tells us, whatever, whenever you read the scriptures, something that it teaches us about God, just take one thing and then take it with you through the day. Think about it, meditate on it, dwell upon it, savor it. Just think about its truth and its implications for your lives. Two other perfections of God are fuel for joyous celebration here. Verse 10, the fact that God's right hand is filled with righteousness. You know what that means? That means that He always does what is right, without exception. He always values and promotes the thing that is most valuable. He always values and promotes His glory more than anything else. And this is precisely what makes Him righteous. This is His righteousness, His unswerving commitment to the advancement of His glory. And it's why we know that we can always count on him to keep his word because he would never make a promise to his people and then not keep that promise because he will never deny himself. You can bank on the righteousness of God. And that's worth celebrating as it is in this psalm. And then verse 11, God's people rejoice here because of God's judgments. Now that's not normally something that we would think would trigger celebration. Yes, our God is a judging God. He judges. But it is, and the reason it is, is because it tells us that our God is a God of justice. And that's a topic as relevant as the headlines in the news today. We hear a lot about justice, the call for justice. Rightfully so. Justice is God's faithful administration of his kingdom in accordance with his law and his official righteousness and the requirement that humans adhere to the standards that he set. That's what it means to live a life of justice. Justice involves the concern that each person receive that which is rightfully his or hers. But God is central to the concept of justice. And the problem is that when God is removed from the equation, justice becomes based on human opinions instead of God's unchangeable character. And too often then, justice becomes whatever the most powerful people say it is, 
which means in the end that only the most powerful people get justice. So when a culture like ours marginalizes God, denies Him, sets Him aside, true justice cannot be achieved. Wayne Grudem says it should be a cause for thanksgiving and gratitude that when we realize that righteousness and omnipotence are both possessed by God. Because if he were a God of perfect righteousness without power to carry out that righteousness, he would not be worthy of worship. And we would have no guarantee that justice will ultimately prevail in the universe. But if he were a God of unlimited power and yet without righteousness in his character, how unthinkably horrible the universe would be. There would be unrighteousness at the center of all existence and there would be nothing anyone could do to change it. Existence would become meaningless and we would be driven to the most utter despair. So we ought, therefore, continually to thank and praise God for who He is, quote, as it says in Deuteronomy 32, 4, for all His ways are justice, a God of faithfulness without iniquity, just and righteous is He. Cause for celebration. We have cause to rejoice because of God, His commitment to justice, to render righteous judgments, means He should greatly be praised. Stanza number four, verses 12 to 14. God's presence gives us a legacy to pass on. Walk, go ahead, walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, so that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will guide us forever. What are we to tell the next generation? This is our God. Our God, forever and ever, He will guide us forever. Awareness of this transcendent reality explained and passed on to our children and grandchildren. German philosopher Hegel said, life has value only when it has something valuable as its object. And it's meant to be God. I went to our website and I was preparing this message and looked at our kids 44 section and I read this. Every kids 44 class from nursery to elementary age contains an element of biblical theological instruction. Our curriculum is Bible-saturated, God-centered, and Christ-exalting in its content and aims to help children grow in their understanding of the gospel, in living the Christian life, and passionate love for God. Thank you all who serve in Kids 44. There are so many dedicated servants behind the scenes here who care about and invest in our children, who partner with parents because parents are the primary, primary disciplers of their children. The church has a role to play in equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry, so we should be partnering together. But the goal has to be this, to fan into flame a love for God. It's the greatest commandment of all, to love God with all that you are. We lose the next generation if they don't come to see the glories of our God. They're not going to stand against all of the charms that are presented to them in this culture if they don't come to a wondrous adoration of our God. How sad it is to think of children who spend year after year after year growing up in a church and the farthest they get is, did you have a good time? Instead of, what did you learn about God today? That's what we want. It happens in our pursuit student ministry too with Travis. I mean, just go online and look at some of his lectures. I mean, it's just, it's God, God, sad God just in, all over the place. 
This is our highest uh, calling or most sacred responsibility as a parent is to tell the next generation this is our God. Some of you know John Trent from his writings. He said, not long ago, my family and I had the privilege of going on a cruise, and as I sat on the deck drinking coffee, I overheard a heartbreaking conversation between a 10-year-old boy and his mother. But why, Mom, the boy asked, oblivious to those around him, why did he even bother to come? I could see his mother struggle to frame her answer. Well, she said, he's here and he paid for all of us to go on this trip. He's not here, her son shouted. He's been on the phone or his computer the whole time. And then came the shot to the heart. Doesn't he even want to be with me? You can't get much closer physically than spending seven days in a tiny cabin on a cruise ship but what broke this boy's heart was having a dad physically present but emotionally and relationally absent. Sound convicting, Trent says, it was to me. I'm amazed at how quickly my children are growing up and as I think back, I'm ashamed at how many times I've just looked past Carrie to catch a meaningless play in some game or hurried through a bedtime story with Laura so I could get back to the computer to finish a project. When all of my face time with the kids and the grandkids is feeding an impression about God and His worth. This is our God. Can you believe our God? How amazing he is. It's a challenge not only to those in Kids 44 or our pursuit ministry, it's a challenge to all of us who are in a position to influence children. After teaching this last night, I thought I'd pull out some examples just to share with those of you who are interested. There's a whole questions series. I don't know if it's still in print or not. Put out by Tyndale, like 101 questions about God, 102 questions about prayer, 103 questions children ask about right from wrong. And uh, I just love this because they're like one page, uh, little thoughts. Uh, Raise a question. Here's one. How can I love my enemies? Here's an answer given with some scripture text and then maybe a note to parents about how to pray as you close your time with the child. And then so I just grabbed this one and brought it with me and didn't notice till I got here. Taylor and dad read through this in the fall of 2001 and 2002. 801 questions kids ask about God with answers from the Bible. All kinds of resources today, more than ever now. The New City Catechism, the app is free. It has videos. You don't even have to be the one teaching. Just watch it with your children to spur on conversations. This is what it says in Deuteronomy. This is the charge given to parents when you get up, when you walk in by the way, when you go to bed at night. Talk about these things, Moses said. How much more now when we know the fullness of the gospel? We used to, um, the Dictionary of Cultural Literacy by E.D. Hirsch, you probably have to, well, I think it's still in print. I know you can find old copies uh, around thrift stores, but there's a whole chapter in there on what it means to be literate in the Bible with definitions of every character and all the major principles. And um, we used to turn that into a Jeopardy game with the family. And I would craft the questions for like the three or four year olds, you know, and then the, and then the older the kids got, the harder the questions were. So I just kind of make one up based on that information. And I think it was fun for them. And I know that it increased their knowledge of the scriptures and introduced them to the greatness of our God. God has promised never to leave us or forsake us, to be with us to the very end of the age. He is with us. His presence is with us. And therefore, we are secure. Therefore, we have cause for joyous praise and celebration. Therefore, we have been given authority over spiritual agents of evil. And therefore, we have been given an understanding of the purpose of life to pass on to our children. Do you understand what a great, precious gift this is to know the purpose of life 
and to be able to teach it to your children? I close with Packer. What were we made for? To know God. What aim should be we uh, set ourselves in life? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What is the best thing in life? Bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else. What is that thing? Knowledge of God. Once you become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. What makes life worthwhile is having a big enough objective, something which captures our imagination and lays hold of our allegiance. And this the Christian has in a way that no other person has. For what higher more exalted and more compelling goal can there be than to know God. Tell the next generation this is our God. Let's pray. Father, many times we're just convinced this, the deck is stacked against us. There's just too much evil, too many temptations, too accessible to our children, to the next generation. We fear, and yet you've told us who you are. You've raised a prophets to teach us who you are. You even sent your son, and in him we have seen the fullness of all that you are in bodily form. We have seen the exact representation of who you are in Jesus. And his apostles faithfully wrote scripture that we may pass it on to our children. God, I pray for your grace to be poured out on our lives and on this ministry in such a way that the next generation would find their affections won over by the glory of our God. That they would experience the reality of your presence in this place. That whenever we read or teach or study the Bible together, it would be with a sense of holy reverence at who you are, what you've revealed about yourself and the invitation to draw close, to be the objects of your eternal steadfast love. Oh God, Don't let us stop with mere knowledge, but let us break through to deep intimacy, to satisfaction that is found only in you. Let us taste and see your goodness for ourselves that we may introduce our children and grandchildren to it, to you. This we pray for the glory of your son and his kingdom and for the goodness of your people. Amen.